That's what she's doing. Exactly. So, guys, we have uh, extra time for the pregame show because getting Anne on screen is something we know how to do. Um, uh, so, uh, just to warn everybody, because I don't want people to think this is uh, uh, take people by surprise, I have an event I have to do at 6 o'clock today, which means I have to have a hard stop at, at 5.55 that will not be a reflection in any way on Anne, uh, uh, who I'm sure we could talk with for uh, hours and hours and hours. Um, Especially if I had a drink, but I don't. You should. Yeah, I know. You should. I'm getting Go actually. get one. Yeah, I, gotta oh. wait a bit. I have been in front of my computer all day, literally. Yeah, hurt your I eyes. got a quest. Uh, maybe? I don't really know anymore. <laughs> I, I, I can see the reflection in my glasses. I have taken to having a mid-afternoon nap, which helps. Ah, I did that yesterday. I've, I've been I doing think, it a lot of days. I think it's very uh, I'm very I'm jealous. I don't, I'm not a morning person, folks, so I don't really... I am a, I am a crazed morning person. Oh, like I can it, tell, it, you get up by the time I'm up, you've already, like on a whole Twitter thing. And got yeah, no, I mean, if I did not force myself to stay in bed some day, a lot of days, I would be up by 4.30. I can usually force myself to stay in bed till 6, but I not always. I knew you were one of those people. See, I need a lot of sleep, and I, so I, I decided once I learned that about myself, I was never going to be as productive or successful as I wanted to. You know, it's it's like some people are night so productive yeah. people. I mean, that's the that's Chris true, Hitchens thing. Nice. But I also really need eight or nine hours of sleep. Eight, I bet you don't need that much sleep either, do you? I was actually just talking about with this on Twitter with Scott Shapiro because he was saying he was a nap person. And I am almost, I like so rarely nap, I can probably count them every year on one hand. Um, I, uh, I sleep like four hours a night or I sleep like 10 hours. It's like it goes through phases. Yeah. It's, um, Let's pull on this. Yeah. Yes. I just want to no. say something to um, the lovely Greek chorus, as I like to call us, uh, which is that uh, I'm not a great multitasker. I'm going to be able to see what you're saying, but I'm not going to be able to type. Sorry. Do I wanted you to have a consistent bed? Not Ben. Bed <laughs> slash wake up time. I bet most people. Yes. It's supposed to be healthy. No. Sort I mean, of. like, I do like the occasional, I do like still the occasional all nighter. I like, I, I get a lot I of I have on. never once done that. Oh my God, Ben. Really? Not like not even in college. I did it all the oh. time because I was editor of the college newspaper, and we used to have to stay. There was just too much time. stuff to do. All right, and one more question: Do you get enough sleep? Yeah. That's yes. like the answer to that is always no. No, and I get enough sleep. It doesn't matter that it's the um, the uh, pandemic. All right, there right. we have the sleep thing. Let's go live. Um, ah, wait a minute. Where is, we got a, okay, there we go. And we're live. Oh, uh, except we're not. Um, we're, kind of, we're all three kind of wearing the same color scheme. If you... I mean, are you guys wearing dog shirts? No. I can go put on my dog shirt. you and Kate together, you gotta get my shirt. Yeah, that's kind of true. Oh, gosh, Ben. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, yeah, torture you with the dog shirt today. Of course. Um, I love the dog shirts. Yeah, but Anne, Anne has dog I'm shirt issues. Um, we're live on Twitter. Hello, Twitter. And we're live on Facebook. Good evening to everybody who joins us on Facebook, like the three people who watch us on Facebook. Um... 
But we love you guys, the ones who watch us on Facebook, and we're sorry that Facebook keeps canceling and my account so that it doesn't, uh, we, can't, we can't be regular about it. Um, and now we're just waiting for the blue go live button to turn blue. If you think about this, the one group of people who does not know about the blue go live button and how much anxiety it causes me are the people for whom the blue go live button is actually relevant, which is to say those who watch us on YouTube. The rest of you all know about the blue go live button and hear about it every day even though it has no relevance to your life other than as a portrait into my uh, fixation with buttons that are still not blue when we need them to be. Blue go live button. What's, what does it have to do with Plato's cave? What are saying? Oh, I guess the light always trying to I'm a little bit worried that the blue go live button isn't turning blue today. Yeah, this is crazy. I'm not. This is <laughs> longer than it usually takes. Well, that's because everything else went okay. Yeah, maybe. So, um, maybe is there something wrong with the tech specs? Of let me check, because something is hinky today with the blue go live button. Something is up. Something's wrong. Uh -oh. um, let's see. I wish we had some Jeopardy music. I know. I can talk about this great new mug that arrived in the mail for me today. Wait for it. It's beautiful. Oh my goodness. Lizard That's people. <laughs> I don't know who sent this to me. I have my suspicions though. Well, someone sent it to you. How do people get your address? If I asked, would you get Well, there? that's why I have a limited, also got it's one. A limited, a limited, a limited Venn diagram, if, if you will, of people that have both my address and Ben's address. Right, right. <laughs> Could be your friend in Colorado. So Joyce with, says you're live on Facebook. We are live on Facebook. We're live on Facebook and we're live on Twitter. It's Not just either. YouTube that is being difficult. Um, all right, what we're gonna do is we are going to, what if, yeah, it thinks the streaming software is not connected, but the streaming software certainly thinks it's connected. Hmm. And- um, okay, We're not live on YouTube, it's been confirmed. Oh, we're, we're definitely not live on YouTube, on-, yeah. on uh, YouTube. No, Does, we can't. Hang I mean, on, we're gonna. Kind of like a repository okay. for all the. Shows. Try something drastic here. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Um. I may vanish for a second. Okay, Ben. And boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Don't we be scared. Are having scared trouble about. connecting. It turns out it's like. YouTube and then I'm scared of a like, technological conflagration. Um. Uh oh. Ta-da! It's just you and me for a second. Well, it's quieter. There's a lot of. Um, no, maybe it was. I thought it was your. I thought it was your um, audio that was giving us the background noise, but it was definitely Ben. Um. So, well, how's your semester started out? Crazy I busy. Started yet, and it's already crazy. Yeah. Really? Because, of, well, department chair. If it weren't, if I weren't department chair, it would be. That's your completely. Oh but well, I start. I don't go in person. I don't. I go in person on Tuesday. Oh. Um, but I, uh, I'm right now. I'm just teaching remotely, and so far it's great. It's just like, so so much time. Like, you know, a couple hours to prep for every class before the class. And then you teach for two hours and you do it twice a week right. per, per class. And I've got three classes. So three. it's just kind of like, yeah, I'm not, it's like nine credits. And it's like, oh if I wasn't, most of it's, I've, I've done it all before, but a couple of things are new and, you know, info privacy and internet law change all the time. So oh, God. it's kind of crazy. 
Um, I to Alice's question in the chat, I have finished figured out my queen's commute. Um, we're oh, yeah, borrowing. We're paying, we're paying for. We're uh, a friend nearby us in Brooklyn um, has a car that they rarely use, and so we are going to use their car um, for for like and pay them for the privilege, and it's just so much better, cheaper, and like Perfect. it's great for them. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I wish I could take a seaplane from the Cape. I did have like one hot moment of like looking at how expensive it was going to be to buy a car. And I was like, maybe I could like commute by helicopter. <laughs> and then I was like, no, it turns out that's not less expensive than buying a car. <laughs> that would be like a blooper. All right. Well, I have isolated the problem. Um, and, the pro Sorry. and the problem is that... Uh, YouTube uh, Crowdcast is being very hinky today and is not interfacing with YouTube properly and by the way was did not let me uh, back in easily. So okay. I think we are going to just dispense with YouTube today. I'm going to leave a note for the YouTube people. We are unable to connect Crowdcast to YouTube today. Please join us in Crowdcast. I will upload the video later to YouTube. So sorry about that. Um, all right. Um, let us... Then we don't have to click go live. We can just declare that we're live. And that's what I'm going to do. And we're live. It is... Uh, Thursday, January 28th, 2021, 5.07 p.m. I don't need to explain to you why we're late today because we've been live for all of you guys ever since we were right on time. You've, um, uh, to all of our YouTube people who are um, uh, uh, angry at us for not being there, uh, you're not hearing this anyway, so to hell with you. Um, uh, I know I'm humbly apologizing. I'm deeply sorry. Uh, and Kate, you have the monologue today. I believe the subject is unattended candles. <laughs> yes. Um, so yesterday when we had Lan on, which was such a great conversation and moving and just, uh, it was just one of the, one of the reasons I love this show so much. Um, I got a text message in the middle is like everybody, kind of, a lot of people know that I, from a neighbor that my people, the fire department had just broken down my door and that my apartment and the hall was, were filled with smoke. Everything turned out to be fine. A few minutes later, as I checked in, it was the apartment below us. Um, and there was like very little damage. There was very or no damage into my apartment, um, but the whole, all of the sprinklers went off in the whole building. All of the elevators are down because of it. It's just like this whole, uh, whole thing. But it turned out that the uh, the fire was started by a candle that was unattended and knocked over by the tail of a dog. And so I was just, the dog is fine, but uh, the apartment is not. And um, the, uh, and the person who lived in the apartment is, uh, is fine. But um, this is the second close scrape I've had with unattended candles. When I was in law school, one of my very uh, closest friends in law school um, lost his entire apartment to, uh, a, to a unattended candle three, three doors down that put the entire Washington apartment complex into flames and dehomed like 20 people and he lived on my couch for like a month and a half while he figured out alternative housing and had no clothes. I remember him like wearing like a couple of like old t-shirts that I'd stolen from boyfriends and I was like, here, Mike, put this on. <laughs> like, here's some clothing because you have no belongings. Um, Anyways, this is all just to say that when I was a kid, I used to really think that candles were the jam and I used to want to burn them all the time and my room and my mom was like, no. And I was like, mom, you're a fascist. You're like oppressing me. Like I want to burn candles. This is my freedom of expression. Rachel's mom lets her burn candles. Um, and uh, my mom Rachel's mom, by the way, no longer has a house. Right. I know. Um, and, uh, and my mom would like, forcibly come in and like take the candles out of my room and like be like you can barely remember to like 
you know, like put on deodorant every day, kiddo. Like you cannot like have a candle in your room. <laughs> Some of these things haven't changed. But anyways, this is all just to tell you one, to buy renter's insurance and two, to not burn candles, <laughs> and leave them unattended. So that is uh, the thing. I'm starting to kind of come around to this idea that maybe candles are like not worth uh, burning down your house or other people's houses for <laughs> like as a general concept, even and though I so, like fire a lot. So Kate is, uh, what she's trying to say is that we're not allowed to have fun anymore <laughs> and you're not allowed to have candles anymore either. Yeah, I'm coming for them. You can go live with Rachel's mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can burn down Rachel's mom's house. In lieu of fun and in lieu of candles and in lieu of Rachel's mom's house, we have Ann Kornhauser today, who I am still stunned to learn is the Ann Kornhauser, uh, which I uh, learned, what, uh, three months ago at the Cabin in the Woods, and uh, uh, I am still gobsmacked by, uh, I would say welcome to the show, except that you are usually on the show. Right. So welcome to this part of the show. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, um, so you, you um, uh, so the audience knows who you are, uh, so we don't need to do the elaborate right. normal introduction that we normally don't do. Um, uh, yeah. We usually forget to do that and just kind of remember sure. at some point that we haven't said who the person is. Um, but with you, we actually don't need to do it. Um, you said uh, in our uh, discussions of... Uh, the subject we were going to talk about today, that you wanted to talk about FDR, Biden, and the future of democracy. Yeah. And this um, struck me as a really interesting subject because I think that I have thought about writing the, like, this year as 1933 essay. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having assuming a presidency in the midst of a very deep economic crisis with two major authoritarian challenges sort of posing opportunities or alternatives around the world and uh, and a very divided political system. And so I want to start with the question of to what extent does the 1933 analogy work and to what extent is it the kind of, is it cheapskate history by faux non-historians who like to sound erudite? Right. <laughs> uh, like, which is to say I, me. <laughs> I don't remember where I heard this recently, but from some historian who was asked some analogic question and said, uh, things change, so it's always no in that sense, right? It's always different people, different institutions, different contexts. But, uh, you know, we don't study the past just for the sake of learning about the past. We do, th you know, there are uh, plenty of, I don't know if we can draw lessons exactly, but um, we can draw parallels. So, um, 1933 and 2021. Well, the first thing to say is I discovered that Biden plagiarized FDR's first inaugural. So that, that's really bad. And in his that, inaugural? Yeah, no, he didn't. But I'm sure <laughs> that the speech writers read it because there's some definite, there's themes. There are themes that are too obvious not to have. Um, and one of them, interestingly, is truth, um, which I think we should come back to. But so Roosevelt says right at the beginning, this is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country. So there's a difference there right away, which is that for the, the truth then was about, you know, how bad things are. I mean, there's some of that now too, especially with relation to the pandemic. But, um, you know, he, I, that was, you know, Roosevelt was famously a very good sort of reassuring uh, presence uh, with his fireside chats and radio, the radio, chats, etc. Um, and, you know, the rest, by the way, that then goes into we have nothing to fear but fear itself, which is, of course, the most famous line from this speech. Um, but so there are, so that's a parallel that is, you know, this is a time of, in times of crisis, it's more important 
than usual that we face so-called, you know, the, the truth, let's say the facts. Um, um, so that's one thing. Another thing is democracy hanging in the balance, uh, actually probably more so than the now. Um, Certainly in Europe, obviously, right? So people forget that, right? Yeah, how they do. how context how sort of uh, the degree to which democracy was a uh, contingent sort of yeah. option at that point. But you know, this is the period of time when uh, Ezra Pound writes uh, the Jefferson or Mussolini essay. Uh, for those who don't know it, his choice is Mussolini, um, yeah. uh, which le leads him down a deep, dark path. Uh, by the way, uh, Anne, the audience is saying that you're very quiet. Oh, I can hear okay. you fine, but um, if you can adjust your system settings to turn up your mic gain a little bit, that would be great. Okay, um, she's super quiet for me too, Ben. Oh. Uh, get audio video help. Uh, no, no. So just go to your system settings. Um, oh, on the computer. On the computer, and there'll be a sound option. Yes. And is this better? Hello. Uh, Hello? not really. Okay. Um, really, I just turned up the headphones, a the volume a lot. But, but that's the that's the volume as you hear it. Uh, oh, right. There will be an input side of that. Oh, I see. I'm really, um, an input, sound settings, sorry people. Yep, sound settings. Uh, what am I, I want the microphone. Yep. Uh, can't, uh, sound control panel. Huh. Could you just also possibly, Anne, you have a, with your microphone on your headphones. Yeah, you could just, just hold your, hold your it mouth. up near. Your... Let me try that because I'm. Is that better, people? No difference, actually. Maybe it's not. Yeah, connected it's it's, to your it's maybe at all. not. So people are saying that I'm loud, and if I were quieter, then um, you are very uh, loud. And there's a background. I can, I can bring myself down. That's easy enough. Um, hang on. No Microphone settings, right. I I looked into the mic. I think there's something wrong with my microphone settings, people, on my computer. Um, okay, I just brought myself significantly down. Okay. Does that, Does that help, help, people? Is that better? Everyone for even? You're always loud. The volume is fine. Just go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll make it work. Hey, can you hear me? Okay. All right. Um, Where were we? Oh, Mussolini and fascism. Yeah, I mean, so there are alternatives, right? And in a way that the alternatives today are sort of soft, I don't see anybody like in the United States saying what we really need is the Chinese Communist Party. But I think internationally there is, and domestically there's definitely an attraction to authoritarian movements yes um well i was going to say that uh, another i don't know yeah so that's a similarity i think there was even well i think i know there was even greater attraction in the 30s including in some ways by roosevelt and his people themselves that is to say they look at they looked at italy they looked at Germany and they were doing better. Oh, that's nice. Um, in some ways, economically, um, they had more control over the economy. So this idea, particularly of corporatism, where business and labor and the state all get together and plan, that was attractive. Um, not full-throated fascism, you know, and getting rid of democracy, but more planning, you know, from the top down. And so, but, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I think people on this podcast will know that um, there had been, you know, Germany, uh, that a number of countries in Europe, not just Germany's most famous, Italy, obviously, um, had been democratic, or at least partially so, or Republican is a better word, small r, and then, you know, in the 30s, 20s and 30s, became 
authoritarian, totalitarian, fascist, whatever you want to. So, and I do think it's important to keep in mind actual fascist countries when we talk about the threat of fascism here or, or authoritarianism. It doesn't mean there's no threat, but we're, in my view, we're not that close. To the but there's the other thing that was interesting about that period was that there was a real communist alternative, too. Right. Uh, and so I think, you know, Roosevelt takes office with a, a genuine you know, rise of fascism going on. I mean, he comes to power, the say he takes office the same year Hitler comes to power. But um, after 10 years of demonstration project for Mussolini that that lots of people saw as at that point anyway, as very successful. But it's also the height of the prestige of the Soviet Union. For sure. um, and uh, um, you know they haven't had the surprise attack from the Nazis yet. They're, they're. You know, they people thought they were going to vanish in a couple of years. They didn't. Um, and again, they actually dealt with the this is a global crisis in capitalism then as now, but worse then so far. And they dealt with that, the Soviets did better, at least initially, and depending on what you mean by better, but in economic terms better, right, than certainly we were doing. Um, I just want to say one other thing about, sorry, go ahead. Can you just describe what you mean by better? Like, what was happening that means that, like, the Soviets dealt with better? Sorry? I, I sorry, your know. sound is now terrible, Kate. Um. <laughs> it was something about the Soviets. Oh, now Ben's gone. This is fun. no. I'm still I'm oh. still here. Okay. My video just toggled off, um, but I am here. Okay, is is oh, that better? I can hear you now. Yes. Yes. Okay, I lowered it because someone told me that I was very very loud, and then like whatever. Anyway, so but I was just going to ask again. I wanted to ask you two kind of defining questions. You said let's talk about this in terms of fascism, but fascism then. But I wanted to pause on that for a second because sure. I think that if you don't take like a second to define what you mean. We have these terms that float around all the time, like fascism, like capitalism, like kind of like social and socialism, all these isms, and they mean right. like something different in every kind of moment. And people like, okay, like go back in time and don't have the context for what that meant then and everything else. So take a moment and maybe just like tell us what was meant by fascism during kind of the, t the period in time that we're talking about with FDR. Okay, uh, well, pretty much the same thing it means now um, in, for, among people who try to carefully define it anyway. And although there are differences in terms of how it's defined, but I'm just going to tell you a few key points, I think. Um, uh, state control of the economy and society. Um, virtually total, though. It varies a bit, and Nazi Germany was worse than fascist Italy in that respect. And that includes communist Soviet Union, too. Hi, Ben. Um, Sorry, now, Tomas wanted to see my giant new blue mic, oh, um, okay. which Tammy talked about on rational okay. security. Uh, and um, uh, so I had to give him a view okay. of the, the giant blue mic. Um, one party control as well, okay? Uh, and. Uh, what, you know, whether there's a fascist ideology is harder, but, uh, you know, uh, at the time particularly, a focus on a charismatic leader who was going to use the, through the party, the levers of the state to uh, fix everything, particularly the economy at the time. Um, and, you know, obviously the absence of democracy, the absence of public participation, um, it's rather, it's rather but extreme. But isn't one of the hallmarks of at least that period of fascism, um, like the sort of classical 30s fascism, is the kind of adoption of the communist relationship between the state and the party. That is, the party yes. is actually the organ of power. The state is collateral to that. Com the, combining that with sort of ultra-nationalism and militarism and a, yes. and a sort of Fuhrer principle or, a, you know, like 
Right, so uh, charismatic uh, authoritarian leader, right, good point. Uh, running the state through the party, and all loyalty goes through the party. Um, and uh, what else did you say? Militarism, though not that alone, because like for, among scholars, Japan was not considered fascist. It was authoritarian militarism, though. Um, you know, they could be wrong. But, um, and uh, what else? He says something else. Oh, and I did want to go back to corporatism, which is really important. This, this uh, super planning of everything, um, often with business and uh, labor, was the other big party to that. So the state, the party, state, labor, and business would cooperate to plan the economy. So, to yeah. what extent do you think that? this situation, so we don't have a real fascist alternative, although we do have authoritarian nastiness alternative, right? Yeah. Um, we don't have a revolutionary left alternative, although there is a sort of decline of U.S. prestige abroad and the sort of attractions of CCP or Putin or yep. I don't know if anybody finds Putin attractive, but some people find the Chinese model attractive. Um, we do have, you know, a collapsing uh, economy. Uh, we have coronavirus, which has no analog then. Um, how do how do you understand like ultimately? Is this a Roosevelt kind of moment, or have we sort of exhausted the um, uh, have we exhausted the similarities? No, I think there are some similarities, and let's let's talk about them. If, if not not necessarily fascism, as we've said, but um, one of the things um, that Roosevelt actually says in his inaugural speech, his first inaugural, he had many, as we know, um, was that you know, desperate times, these are my words, right, require desperate measures, and I'm going to do take those to save the country, and um, I'm hoping that the legislature, i.e. Congress, will work with me, so I'm going to try legislation, but if that doesn't work, quote, I am prepared under my constitutional duty, uh, sorry, but in the event that Congress shall fail to take, you know, to make legislation, and in the event that the national emergency is still critical. Critical. I shall not shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis: broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency, as great as the power that would be given to me if it were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Which is like so ironic, right? Because that's of course what happens. So he's he's saying he's going to ask Congress for emergency power. Actually, he doesn't. For the most part, he takes it because there are emergency powers in the presidency, as we know. So lots of executive orders, lots of emergency executive orders. Um, we see Biden doing that already. Part of that now is because of hyperpartisanship and the inability to get things through Congress. But I really, I didn't, I don't like it. No matter who does it, and by the way, Democrats do it as often as Republicans, it's not a partisan thing. But I do like the fact that Roosevelt said he was doing it and that he felt he had, or would do it, and why. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so what is it here, just to refresh for me? It is ex acting through executive power, specifically executive orders. Um, by the way, uh, he had, there was a war and a Great Depression, so you would expect more of them, but he has by far the greatest number, even per year of any president since we've been keeping track, which was formally in the 1930s. Um, so I think that this, uh, if it's okay, I would love to kind of go back to like what it meant for for FDR to, to take, to use executive power in this way, what it meant for him to seek out support of Congress and not to do it unilaterally, but also to make gestures for congressional support and support for for the things that he was trying to do when he could when, instead of doing them exclusively through the unit for, through the a unitary executive power um and i want to contrast that to kind of and i want to kind of come back and loop around also to words and these descriptors mm -hmm. and the word socialism and the word fascism kind of being thrown around in like when i took history 
Um, and I do not specialize in this era at all. <clears throat> so this is like, this is completely where I kind of want your expertise. Mussolini was the quote unquote, the fascist party, like literally, like that's like the party that he, he came into power under. That, right. Like Nazism was technically like the, like the German socialist movement. Then you had, um, you know, of course, like in Russia, like kind of the communist movement, and then you, you had all these terminologies. And what I want to kind of say about them for a second is that I feel like calling someone a socialist is closer to calling someone a communist now and calling someone a fascist is some type of like um, authoritarian type of thing. And you said specifically that Japan is different from this because it wasn't fascist. It was authoritarian. I understand those distinctions. But like, tell me a little bit like when you read someone being called a fascist today do you think that anyone is pegging that to kind of our definition of fascism from like an era of Mussolini in this in this respect anyway they often it's when people not Trump that's a different question when people call him that but citizens let's say it's they display that they're often self-identifying as fascist proto-fascist neo-fascist whatever through symbology, you know, through symbolism, through uh, uh, rhetoric, right? Whatever. So in that case, I think it's fair enough. If someone is self-identifying as having those sympathies, whatever it might mean to them, then, you know, we have to be careful. We have to watch that. Um, And that has grown. It's grown in Germany, obviously, too, um, and elsewhere, uh, France. Um, Exactly what it means to them today, you know, has resonances with that then, but not, it's not the same thing. Um, the rest of the question was, what was it, Kate? Remind me, sorry. Kind oh, of were... the movement, uh, the, 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 the movement and kind of the closeness over time that socialism and communism have kind oh, of yeah, like yeah. come. Okay, great. So uh, back in the, fifth, in the Cold War, in the 50s really, um, scholars invented a term, no, oh, actually Hannah Arendt used it, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, called totalitarianism, which lumped together Soviet communism, right? Fascism, oh, completely. Nazism. I'm like so with you in the in this moment because I actually think I discovered this word and I was like in sixth grade and I was like, oh, this wow. is all of the things that we think is are think are bad are just right. like in this piled into this authoritarian kind of idea of like a party control or a very yeah. dominant state control at the expense of human at, in the expense of human rights. So, but this was of course Orwell's fundamental observation as yes. well, right? That all all totalitarian movements are ultimately the same, whatever they say. Right. Now, actually, since then, and I'm not as familiar with this because my father was part of the totalitarian schema thing, so I've been ignoring the the takedown of it. But there's been a move away from that to try to separate out, actually, uh, re-separate out these different forms of extreme authoritarian societies because there are similarities, but, you know, you, you do lose something if you just call everything. But the big thing about totalitarianism, and Gene Kirkpatrick made this distinction in justifying our friendliness, the U.S.'s friendliness with authoritarian regimes in Latin America in particular. The big difference, and she was a scholar of this stuff too, um, is that totalitarianism, whenever you use it, is is meant to indicate a total control, near total control of society. So every, you know, all the voluntary institutions, every the state is, you know, it takes over education, takes over you know, every institution you can think of is subservient to the party state. Um, in authoritarianism, it's more that you have, you know, an anti-democratic leadership uh, structure. It doesn't mean that all of civil society is, is enveloped in this. That is such a, thank you. That's like a really great, like, that's a really great breakout, actually. That's super useful. Um, I haven't, the, I, it's, it also helps scale what's going on now to what you're talking right. about and how you're saying it's not, it's really not as bad as it was then, even though it seems bad now. Right. And All the, right. The, the, sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say the question is, um, oh, questions. Uh, you know, a, a valid concern now, I think, is uh, do we want to, you know, are we watching it? move toward, are we watching our own society move toward fascism or authoritarianism 
And if we are, don't we want to, you know, do something about it now? Right? So why and, why do you why do you think that the, I mean, you can look at what Trump has done to the Republican Party and say the assertion of essentially total control over the party or, you know, has fascist overtones, the idea of having uh, street militias mm -hmm. is very 1930s uh, or very, very 20s. Um, and um, the idea of having, um, you know, very, very high penalties, uh, not you know, like, let's be measured about it because the penalties don't include, you know, being handed a gun and told to shoot yourself. Um, but they do include some pretty significant costs, particularly to politicians for defecting from. Uh, but there's what there isn't is a a kind of move toward military control of the party okay. or really party control of the military. And I'm wondering, like, why you think it has been softer than that? Is it just that American democratic culture kind of doesn't favor that sort of thing? Or is it that it takes time? What's the... Um, that's a great question. One of the things that I was looking at, thinking about the show, was a, is a report from the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, from 2017 about the weakening of democracy in both Europe and the United States. So part of the answer to this is it's instructive to look comparatively because it's going, it's a broader, as we know, um, development than just here, but yet it's taking different forms. It being the weakening of democracy and the sympathy for extreme movements, mostly on the right, but also on the left. Um, here, uh, I think the two-party system mitigates it a bit, uh, although it ha it also brings up different problems. The two-party system, um, and because in Europe, many in parliamentary system, you can actually get seats in a parliament if you're an extreme par party, as we know. So that gives you more power. Um, and I mean, we this is a tradition in the United States of not actually having. Uh, very extreme politics in either direction, as you point out, right? And I do think the party system, the two-party system is a lot of that. Um, the military, well, out of, if we go out of Western Europe and into Eastern Europe and other, uh, or into, let's say, Turkey, you know, the role of the military is important here, the fact of strong civil military uh, distinctions. Um, and then it's just, it's just, you know, it has a history of being a centrist country that's a little bit hard to explain, but I don't, I don't think it's changed that much in that respect. I want to suggest that there's another factor here, which is that the two-party system in the United States lends itself to both regional diversity within each party and lends right. itself also to relatively weak leader controls over parties, particularly relative to Europe and um, uh, and sure, in parliamentary yeah. systems. Yeah. And yeah. so you have these you have these parties that are uh, I mean, Donald Trump has exercised amazingly disciplined leadership over the Republican Party, but it's still relatively weak by European Absolutely. standards or Israeli standards or, you know, uh, you know, he's not the dictator of the Republican Party. We still talk about, like, how many defectors are there going to be on the Senate vote? Well, it's not going to be 17, but it is going to be right. five or six. Right. And um, and I think that's a very it's a very hard thing to establish, you know, true authoritarianism in the presence of pluralism within a party, yes. even relatively weak pluralism. Right. And I would just, just to tack on very quickly, I would say you can see more of that kind of really uh, top-down party control, not as much anymore, but in the early 20th century, say, in machine politics at the local level in the setting. So there you had very strict party discipline. Tammany Hall. Russian. There you go. New York is 
Exhibit A and Chicago's Exhibit B. But so you, if you want to look for that, you can find it there. Um, but um, I just want to also point out that it's, it's an interesting situation where we have hyper-partisanship now, that hasn't always been the case, and weak parties, which is a really weird combination. David Bott, the floor is yours. Uh, let's, let's see your background today. We've got the, the baby birds screaming oh. for screaming good morning. We've got Nina. We've got Bernie Sanders. Oh. And we've got, we just got the whole package and, and Ben, I see that you've, um, <laughs> you've got a, you've got a mic almost like mine. I do, so, except mine is blue. Is it's that true. seriously your um, mic? Men in their mics, man. Okay. I, I, wait a minute. I just want the record to reflect. I acquired okay. this mic because, okay. um, my wife, um, and I have to record rational security and we have to sit opposite each other. And this mic can be okay. omnidirectional, which my other ones cannot. Yeah. Well, and, clearly uh, I need to get one. Uh, you know, good mics are a great thing. David Botts, what's on your mind? It's impressive. Thing. Yeah, let's, oh. let's all have our mics visible. <laughs> so, uh, so, Anne. Yes. Um, uh, it, it's uh, it's great to see you on this side of the screen. Um, it's fabulous. So, uh, uh, in your opinion, and this uh, uh, consider an audience such as myself, uh, I am not a history major at all. Okay, so I'm. Neither was I. You know, I, I, I'm just a civilian. Okay, um, but what are the what are the two historical things that you wish people like me would know as as you consider our current events wow great question thanks i hate those open-ended questions though because okay uh well one is actually You're not allowed to tell the get the audience that you hate their questions oh i didn't mean i i meant <laughs> i personally have a hard time with them yeah i said it was a great question we're gonna cancel David, you yeah. we're, still we're friends, gonna cancel you right? watch Anne and is canceled <laughs> okay all right i don't hate anything I love everything and everybody. Okay. What is what we've just been talking about, actually, which is the, the what historical fascism, historical communism, you know, and uh, militarism, totalitarianism, what, what, the, what those have been, um, you know, uh, in their institutional and, and political cultural formation. Um, what would be another thing? I guess, yeah, the other thing, actually, we've also talked about on the show, I'm thinking in terms of what's relevant now, which was how hard Reconstruction was and the many reasons it failed, you know, racism would be the most obvious thing that would come to people's minds, right? And the entrenched white supremacy in the South, that's obviously true. But the coercion that was required of the North against the South, that is an internal occupation of our own, the North occupies the South with an army, uh, reforces southern states to redo their constitutions, take loyalty oaths, all sorts of things. These are highly problematic measures in a democracy. So is seceding, don't get me wrong, and so is slavery, right? So I'm not, this is not a defense of anything. It's just a recognition of the um, amount of power that was exerted in the, in the, um, towards the goal, sorry, of uh, racial in the economic justice and democracy. All right. Um, Frank Valadez, Valadez, your uh, hey. the you floor got is yours. Time several, a couple of months ago. Um, that's okay. Um, maybe you'll get to hear it again. And I want to wish everyone with my in lieu of fun class Ooh. a happy National Have Fun at Work Day, which I guess is ironic. Um, so my question um, for Anne is that, so I have a friend, Margaret Story, who wrote a book called Loyalty and Loss on um, unionist, pro-union folks in Alabama in the Civil War era. And one thing that we would talk about was how, like nowadays we read the news, and like people have gone crazy doing the things that they're doing. Right. And he said, you know what, this is exactly what people said, you know, around the Civil War. You know, their neighbors had gone crazy. They can't believe that they believe. So my question for you is how um, 
in your mind, does this era now compare to the Civil War era regarding divisiveness? And uh, and what lessons, you know, do you sort of take from American history, from those eras or others, about unity and comedy and the possibility for those things? I, I will just say, as a side, um, my sense is that race has a, a lot to do with this. If when racial issues are tamped down, it looks like there's unity, but not so much really. And so I'm just curious what you thought. Great question, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm really glad you mentioned the word unity because I wanted to bring that up. That's another thing that is a feature of fascism uh, and fascist-like systems, I'm afraid to say, that is, well, enforced unity. So we want to be, I don't like that word. We discussed this already on the show, so I won't go down that path again. Ben, you said you didn't like. Uh, compromise, reconciliation, uh, comedies with an ITY. These are things that I think might be a better idea because unity, there's always going to be disagreement and should be in democracy. A democracy is about channeling disagreement through political institutions, right, and reaching compromise. Uh, you, you can't have agreement even on many fundamentals, uh, but you hope to get better, you know, answers out of the process by uh, through political debate. Um, so I actually think unity, and I understand rhetorically why Biden would have said that. I don't think it's a great goal though. I think uh, agreement on the rules of the game to start with would be nice. What are facts, you know, what procedural things matter, you know, all those norms that we blew through, procedural norms, process norms, why are those important, things like that. And then we can get down to within having agreed about on the rules of the game, which don't include, let's say, you know, violent protests on either side, but and certainly not storming government uh, buildings and the, the capital in particular, um, then we can try to work out substantive differences. Um, the question as to the comparison, I don't know. I mean, there's no comparison in a sense because there was a secession movement. They wrote their own constitution. They had their own, they, they left the country. And we fought a war uh, to get rid of slavery, but also to bring them back, right? Uh, if that was possible, and it, it, it was uh, over a long period of time. So um, the disunity that there were four different candidates for president when Lincoln ran, you know, uh, the parties couldn't, they, they were even more sectional than they are now, more geographically sorted, let's say. Um, so I, I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. Uh, I hope we don't. I don't think we could because pluralism is, you know, we have much more pluralism built into the system now, um, partly because also, of all of that. Also, we have more of a national culture than we did. Yeah, we have more of a national culture. You know, Mississippi and Massachusetts and California were more different than than they are today. They didn't share, I mean, not that they're similar now, but they do, you know, people do watch the same movies. They do, uh, you know, have the same, there's a, the, mass culture is actually a big unifying, uh, hum, one, one might even say homogenizing uh, factor. For sure, and, and I would just add, so is the economy. You know, back then, the California economy was radically different from Mississippi's economy, was radically different from Massachusetts' economy, right? The, the, the financial, we have financial and service capitalism now, and that has pervaded, you know, all of the states to a large degree. Victoria Murphy, the floor is yours. Is this your first time on screen? Hello. Uh, it is, yes. I've been yeah, a lurker well, for a long time. Well, thank you for coming. Up. What are you knitting? Thank you. Um, this is a sleeve to a black sweater, so it's hard to see. Uh, so my question. So in my former life, I was a um, high school history teacher, uh, AP US history, other things. Um, and a useful framework for the 20th century was these periods of progressive reform like the progressive era itself, the New Deal, Great Society, followed by a period of conservative retrenchment. Um, and I'm wondering, is that framework still valid for where we are now? 
And if so, where are we? <laughs> okay, right. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I always thought that it was a little overdone in the first place, although I, have, I had to teach a doctoral class last year of, of sort of the, the, the required class in the second half of U.S. history, so how to organize that, you know, and to some extent I organized it that way. But um, so I think there's some truth to that in pol high politics still. I think that we often change parties and presidents uh, based on, you know, sort of a, wow, we went too far in that policy or direction, right? Let's pull back. Um, but I don't think, I don't think there's some sort of organic, right, process by which people try to pull, you know, sort of regress to the mean. Um, but there, on the margins, yes. Um, where are we now? I don't know. I'm sorry to say that, but that's my problem as a historian is I need some time. One thing I did want to say when I was thinking about things I wanted to say is that where we are now, and I think this will become more and more evident, is not that Trump is our big problem. Not. He was a symptom more than the cause. They certainly caused some really bad things too, and some maybe not so bad things actually, like he didn't cause any wars. That was a good thing in my opinion. Um, but I think we have to get away from thinking that our problem is Trump. That our problem with our democracy and with the parties and with government and with policy. It's, it's because you can see a lot of the trends that he accelerated were there before. Weakening democracy, trends that we were, that were already weakening democracy. So. That's where we are now, I think, is, is needing to be to shore up our democracy. Daniel Burge, you get the last question this evening. Um, ever since I realized that or I was informed that the chair is green, it has just <laughs> upset my world because my camouflage <laughs> jokes don't work anymore. So I'm going to go into denial in a kind of truth resistant way about the, the chair. <laughs> Uh, he is back. He is in his uh, black shirt against the black chair. No, oh, no. Perfectly camouflaged, slightly backlit, uh, and he gets the last question today. So you're giving the last question to a PhD in history, I just want to say. Okay. <laughs> of course I am. You, th you think it's an accident that I brought him in here last? <laughs> Um, I just want to also say that Nina literally just wandered in here and started nudging my knee, so I think she knew that you were on screen. She says, hello. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Daniel. Um, so historians have focused a lot on influential losers in American history. Barry Goldwater is probably the most uh, relevant example for understanding today. Are there any influential losers, political losers in the 20th century that haven't gotten their due from um, hmm. professional historians? Did you mention in your question, uh, his name is like run out of my head, which is terrible. Who's the cross of gold guy? Hi, JB. Uh, you know, the, the cross, now Daniel's gone. Can someone tell me in the, uh, this is really weird. Come on, the, the Scopes trial. Why can't I Clarence think? Darrow. No, not the lawyer. The Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh, William um, Jennings. Oh, William, William Bryant. Jennings Bryant. 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 Sorry, that's terrible. Oh, See, my God. Fuck you and your candle, John Bordeaux. Oh, <laughs> oh. We're having a war here. Okay, anyway, he uh, probably has gotten due. Thank you, chat, for helping my failing memory. Um, but I do think he was he as influential, arguably, as any as as uh, some of the presidents around him. I think Adley Stevenson falls ah, into this category, too. Um, uh, Not McGovern. No, <laughs> McGovern is a non-influential loser. Although I do want to say, Anne, I, we've gotten this far without talking about legal times, but Legal Times, well, at least when I was working there, was in a building in which George McGovern had his office, his post-presidential office, and we used to share the elevator with him. He was on the eighth floor of, uh, or the fifth floor of, the same floor as we were on it. Is it still on M Street? Or yeah, well, I don't know where it is now, but yeah, it was still on M Street, 17, right. uh, whatever, M Street. And on the eighth floor, and George McGovern also had his office on the eighth floor, and he was so sweet. He would always hold the door for everybody. And 
you can't imagine this this poor nice man who was just so sweet and genteel and lovely to everyone taking on Richard no. Nixon. Too um, nice to be president. Yeah, or, or I mean, too nice to beat anybody, let alone Nixon. John Bordeaux, you popped up on screen just as I was going to end. Uh, I assume you were just here to taunt Kate with the candle. Uh, I will point out that it's an attended candle, not an unattended candle, and therefore Always. it do doesn't fall Always. fall into Kate's thing. But you get the last word today. We have to uh, be I, quick, JB. I know you pressed the time. Got to be a quick last word. I, 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 so I saw a podcast come across today that says thing about John Wilkes Booth didn't die in the barn, and that's why I got to go listen to that. And it, it recurred it occurred to me that I only recently learned of the hangings at Fort Myer of the conspirators around the Lincoln assassination. Um, and Seward was stabbed and all sorts of things happened. So I don't know if that was sedition, but I'm just curious, what do Americans not know about this, other than me just not knowing about the hangings? What do you think that we don't know about? To me, that was the last real sedition e effort. And I'm curious, what, what do you think we need to really remember about that and, and consider? The, the Lincoln assassination? Uh... So I studied with Eric Fodor, but I'm not a 19th century historian anymore. I, I don't know, JB, but I do. I will say this: there were, peop, uh, Germans rounded up for sedition during World War II. And Mary Surratt was guilty and as Mary hell. Surratt, right. She was so, guilty as hell. All that sentimental, uh, yeah. the, all that sentimentalism about her. Come on. She ran the house where they were all plotting. She was a committed Southern person. I mean, like, you know, no, no sentimentalism about them, any of them. I'm not, not for the death penalty, but Jesus, if anybody, any group of people deserved hanging, it was the Lincoln plotters. We are going to leave it there. Um, uh, Ann Kornhauser, you're a great American. It's great to see you. Great and uh, we will be back tomorrow. Who is our guest tomorrow, KK? <laughs> I don't remember either. It's on Tom the Wright. Tom Wright. Oh, Tom Wright, Tom my, Wright. who I'm very excited to talk to about uh, Biden foreign policy, Thank you, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, that'll be 22 hours. Oh, 23 hours and two minutes because we're ending a little bit early. And until Good then, math, we don't have fun anymore. We do still have tech glitches and I will upload this to YouTube uh, uh, and apologies to all that it inconvenienced. Cheerio, folks. Thanks, Anne. Anne it's so great to Thank see you. You, you too. This is fun. Both of you.